Bam, welcome to our playlist, Artist Rewind, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artists. Also, check us out on Patreon, where we have an all-access VIP backstage pass that will unlock full, unedited content. As a kid, I grew up watching this band once a week on my TV, introducing me to music from Chuck Berry to Bo Diddley with comedy, a, one of the best variety shows out there. This episode coming up, we're going to go one-on-one with this performer, how from meeting Jimi Hendrix and Hendrix selecting his band to open up for them at Woodstock before they almost were about to give up and throw in the towel, but how that gig took them on a path and changed their whole career. That's all coming up next on Artist Rewind. Bam! I got, I got the legendary Jocko from Sha Na Na right here. I am so honored to have you. How you doing? I, I'm doing great. Jocko, you, first of all, you were such an, you inspired me to break out the leather jacket. And, that, and that's the truth. I used to watch you as a kid and you were just this, tough guy i go oh my god and i go living in brooklyn i go that's the image i need as a kid because it will protect me on the streets people won't know i'm this neurotic jewish guy they'll know i'm like hey you know the collar up you know yeah it's, scare him with the weather i understand <laughs> where did you grow up I, I gotta ask you i was born in quincy massachusetts and i lived in the boston area or, you know, until I went to school in New York at Columbia, where I, you know, eventually of the five bands I had that year, one of them became Sha Na Na. Wow. Wow. It's wild. Now, I got it. Now, when you started out, what was the name of your first band? When I was a kid? Yeah. Miltones from Milton, Mass., which is right next to Quincy. Then we had a, uh, a band called The Pilgrims, of course, from New England, The Pilgrims. And Lenny Baker was a Plymouth Rock. Who <laughs> eventually, I, I got Lenny into Sha Na Na. Wow. That's, now, Lenny, I got to ask you, because he was always the lovable for everybody out there watching who would sing uh, Blue Moon. He would do his version of, of Blue Moon, correct? Yep. And, yep. and yep. Yep. now, Lenny, was he in Danny and the Juniors? He, um, he, was a, he backed them up and a New England run. So it got in the bio somewhere, and now it says he is in, was in the juniors. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. They did our TV show. They did, I remembered when they did. See, this is why you, you can't believe everything on the internet and in Wikipedia. Yeah. yeah, it was cool, though. That's really cool. So how did how did you and Lenny run into each other? Meet, meet well, he was other? I was in New England, the area we lived in. We left from. We were in a couple of rival bands, and and uh, eventually, you know, we started playing together. I joined the Pilgrims because Lenny said, "Yeah, I, I want Mas because he he can play, but he can sing too." You know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, we did a lot of. He'd come and get me out of school, in Friday afternoons late. I had permission to go with Lenny Baker and we'd have a U-Haul in the back and we'd head up to ski country. I was playing football for Columbia. So there was part of the year I, I not Columbia and for the high school and, and junior high school. This is funny. The, uh, I was the drummer in the band. I was the only drummer they had, but I was also on the football team playing both ways. Eventually I'd be all state and everything. I was a pretty good football player. So at halftime, I take off my pads, go over and get the drum play with the high school band. I was the junior high band. And then uh, afterwards I go back into the game. So it was a crazy, crazy thing. But uh, those are the two things I did. Finally, after Woodstock, the music uh, held out and uh, I stopped my football career, which is good. Yeah. So Woodstock, was Woodstock the break breaking point for Sha Na Na, would you say? Yeah, well, we did. We did on campus and one on at Yale where we and we graphed like ten songs and cut them all down and Blue Moon, you know the obvious ones, yeah. and do up. And then we, you know, we, did, we had to go on early because the students at Columbia and Barnard were like getting way into it. It was like a night off of the revolution. They came as they thought they were. They all busted out 
you know, T-shirts and leathers and, you know, and they were wild. They were a star. So we did the Ten Snow, and then we didn't have any others, so we played them again. And I knew we were on to something. So that summer yeah. we hung around the city, did some gigs, but it was hard to get a, a long-standing gig with 12 people. But we got a, our, my original bass singer, Al Cooper, not that Al, Alan Cooper, went down to mm-hmm. uh, Steve Paul's scene which, in Hell's Kitchen, which was the hangout for rock and roll stars. You know, Zeppelin was in there. We did a two-week run before it was shut down by some local guys from the uh, the family. and uh, But it was cool. We, you know, in those two weeks, Hendrix started coming down. And he came, like, you know, three different nights. And he brought Joplin down, and Led Zeppelin were there, and Frank Zappa was there, and I was going crazy. He was 19 years old, rock and roll fan, and look at all these stars walking around here. Yeah. Finally, it was Jimmy, the last night, brought Lang and uh, the producer of Woodstock down to see us. And what they said, yeah, you're on the bill. Let's do it. I told my manager, Eddie, go go tell him, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do that. And of course, we got like $350 that the check bounced, you know, it, but it didn't. <laughs> it bounced. We, the check bounced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, you couldn't buy that kind of PR for an unknown group. So, we, you know, we played Woodstock and we made the movie, which was, you know, really the At The Hop movie, that hyper version of it. Uh, and actually, Jimmy saved us twice because they were going to cut us. They We kept on back all weekend. And finally, they, you know, they said... Uh, they were going. They were sitting with Hendrix and management, saying, "We want you guys to go on Sunday night, and because the stage is falling down and there's electrical problems and all that." And Hendrix and his people said, "No, there are some acts that haven't gotten on. Have been hanging out all week, so weekend. So give them a shot." So it. Jimmy sort of saved us twice and gave us, uh, you know, uh, a great boost in our career. Wow. Wow. It was like the tempo. It was like pre-punk rock before the Ramones. It was just like, wow, but the energy. And you get the you get the people. They're tr- Back then, everybody, this, we're not condoning this out there for everybody watching, but the <laughs> audience, they're out there like this. You know, they You know, from Santana yeah. Evil Wave to at the hop, bump, 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 you know, and it's pretty. I mean, you could feel the energy behind the backbeat because you must have been so excited and happy to be there to we play. We were so that, excited, you know? we were so exhausted and so excited, and uh, that we, you know, we got on and and they filmed it, and then we got to to, to get an up view of you know one of the greatest guitar performances ever by Hendrix. It's incredible. It was cool. it, it's really what, what was what type of guy was Hendrix? You know, I, I he was so good to us, and he was just quiet. You know, mm. and, I, and of course, when you compare it to what he is when he walks on a stage and puts yeah. on a guitar, and, yeah, you know, he, he was he was great to us and quiet, and he just he so he came from you know he was with the Isley Brothers before he became the Jimi Hendrix we know. He's an R and B guy, so he was cool. I had played even with Little Richard, if I'm mistaken. I could be. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. on top of my head, but he did. A yeah, lot he had of, a do rag in those days in some of those pictures. That's right. Yeah. After Woodstock, that's when it just the eyes were on Sean on on out. The name, the name Sean on out. Well, good job. Yeah, we use it's a nonsensical do up, but it's done in harmony and uh, yeah. that was you know back in those days we didn't couldn't afford horn sections so we all sat by the and do up without them you know yeah it was cool and uh wow. you know we, we were doing the clubs and then, and then we were about to fold it up until we did that gig at bitchin and we got to play a woodstock 
And we ran, you know, then we had great rock and roll years, like six or seven years of touring the world, great times, late, late 60s, 70s. And, you know, we had albums out, did, you know, did some monster concerts, you know, on bills with John Lennon, you know, we, we were, we were walking with the gods, you know. Ray Sting was one of our opening acts. Hollow Notes was one of our opening acts. Steely Dan toured in front of us in, uh, down in uh, the swing. So I remember that they were bad days and do it again was a hit. And they were saying, what should be the next single? What do you think to me? You know, and, and, <laughs> and you know, because one wanted dirty work and one wanted reeling in the years. And I said, and my buddy, who eventually played with Sean and I for a couple of years was Elliot Randall, who took the solo to Reeling in the Years. And so I said, oh, I'm biased, but Reeling in the Years, you know, it yeah. wasn't, wasn't hard to pick. Yeah, incredible song. Incredible yeah. song, the guitar playing. What an what a incredible guitar player he is, Elliot. Oh, Elliot, one of the best. One of the, one of the best. best. He lives in London now. I'm still in touch with him. You still in touch with one of the yeah. best. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's green iconic. Airing. You know, those those things were were monster. As a matter of fact, he just found a he he found some old inch tapes of of his, and he baked them in an oven so he could play them once, digitize them finally. And it was a song that I wrote, and he had John Belushi sing the lead, and Elliot is a monster. Uh, New York guys were on it. And but check out, go to Elliot Randall and, and read about his thing with Belushi. But it was a great sort of Cajun New Orleans group. It's very, very like cool. the, uh, the discovered tapes, you know, it's fun. Belushi, uh, he had a lot of soul and his phrasing. He was, he really sang great. I mean, Belushi. That shows on this thing. He really was, you know, because I do my version, and then it was his was so interesting. Yeah, he'd yeah. wait a few where the where I thought the one was coming. He'd wait a few beats, and uh, he really it was a highly believable performance yeah. that he did thing. Yeah, he definitely he did. You know, we were we were talking a little bit about you know the punk rock and the Ramones and all that stuff, and I was telling you my little history at Ramones. And uh, what an influence with the backbeat with you guys, and, and especially at the hop, if you watch that punk rock theme. And you guys, you were telling me a little story because Sean and I went on to have a successful. TV well, show. I, we, we, were, we were about to fold it in, you know, and, and then at 75, we did a pilot for a TV show, and it really changed the, the, the we weren't, you know, before that TV show, mm -hmm. we'd go on a TV show, they softened it up a little bit. You know, yeah. so, but it was all cool. It was all legitimate. And uh, uh, we went on to have four years of shooting, 97 half hours with uh, an array of, of artists, you know, Charlie Pride, Milton Berle, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Frankie Avalon, you know, just we had, and then, which was, they started even getting more interested later as we got the different kind of acts and they, brought in the Ramones, who were like cool to do it. They were like thrilled. And we did this shtick called Fa for Off of Family Feud. We called it Greaser Feud. It was the Ramones against Shanana. And me and Lenny were in drag to, so we could be <laughs> the female contestants. We did a fair amount of drag on the show. Uh, and, you know, Bob hosted it as an obnoxious guy. And uh, it was very cool. I'm afraid it's a greasiest fraud. Yeah. A fool to guess, to, you know, to, to perform on this show. So uh, it was a lot of variety. It was, My a, it was a great, great, the best show. It really was so entertaining. I, my moment there as a drummer, um, James Brown was booked to do the show. And so he came in, but he, his hit was uh, too funky in here. And what we usually do is pre-record the tracks, you know, send it out to whoever's going to sing. And and we, and we I made sure on that track, I, the band sang the background versus the guys because it was funky. It was R&B. 
and that was bad. And so just before we got the roll tape, you know, there's a TV audience in front of it, and James hadn't heard the track. Hmm. So that's crazy. So they we crowded around the edge of the stage and around the monitor, and they played the song for the TV track for James Brown's Too Funky in Here. And James listened, and he's nodding his head. And then when it's over, he said, who's the drummer? And I said, oh, well, I, you know, I am <laughs> Mr. Brown. And he, his hand up, he said, five, brother. <laughs> so it was cool. James dug my, my drum track with no, you know, he says a drummer. Yeah. He, James is a hard guy too. He was tough on the band. Like he would hear, he's one of those guys that would hear everything too. Exactly. So I, I sort of knew about that. You know, he'd, mm -hmm. he'd hire two rhythm sections and pick out the one that he liked sounding that day. It's yeah, crazy. It is crazy. So, and and that would make any player as a musician a little like, okay. <laughs> yeah, somebody sure sitting you, back in the chair behind you. Yeah. Yeah. It just it's it's like my wife yelling at me in the kitchen, you're not doing it wrong. <laughs> I mess up <laughs> mess up a bowl of soup over there. You met a lot of people and you played with a lot of great people, especially you could see, you know, on, on the Shana Na show. Out of is and James Brown might be the story, what might be the answer, but the one person that really like, wow, I can't believe I'm here playing with this person. Who would that be? Wow. That really well, out. I love Little Richard and I got to do some gigs with him and, you know, and just Little Richard was the, the king of rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And of course, I told you about James Brown. But gee, the, the hard to pick out one of the things. My, and it was a moment with John Lennon and, and Yoko at the Madison Square Garden. And Stevie Wonder was on the bill and Roberta Flack. And uh, the and it was a pretty exciting moment to be there in that. Wow. I mean, Lennon. And uh, can you tell me a little about you know that? Did you... Aldo Rivera did it. And it had to do with... Uh, hospital hospital in the area and you know it was a definitely a benefit gig and uh they, they put us on the bill i'm sure john had something to do with it and yeah i i only met him fleetingly you know yeah yeah and i and at another point too i i i had a band called hollywood rock and roll review and we would we did a gig with joe walsh in santa barbara we had fun and i was singing she's about to move uh and uh, just, I didn't know this, was recording a Ringo album. He said, I want to bring you guys in. Can you come? So we did the gig with him and all that. And then we went to a studio. And we, and I did sing Lee, but I was saying background and, and, and percussion. And we cut a cool version of She's About a Mover that Ringo sang. And it was released in Canada by Ray. You should find that. It's very cool. Wow. Big section, yeah. And, uh, you know, so those are my Beagle experiences. I saw them twice. Once you at did? Boston Garden and the one at Suffolk Downs in Boston. Who was it? The con Could you hear them? It was great. Oh, yeah. You know, well, my dad was tight with the FBI guys in town. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why or how. And uh, so we'd get good seats. We were sort of in a box up a little bit, but we had a great view of the stage. And I think it was Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells with the opening act. Oh. You know, they they toured with girl groups yeah. a lot on the first tour. Um, with Shauna Na, when you say you were going to give it up before the TV show, what 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 was your what would have been the plans? What were you thinking you would be doing after if you, if Shauna Na didn't take off? I I'd, I'd finished my degree. I had already done while we were touring i got a ba from columbia and a master's mm -hmm. from nyu and i was in theater and combinations of it all and uh you know i didn't know really i was just gonna know i wanted to keep playing and singing mm -hmm. and uh 52 years later of the same group is pretty crazy is but pretty uh crazy. we got we got some long longevity out of this thing you got it's it's and you open doors. I mean, you definitely when you think in inspired 
pieces of American graffiti, grease. I mean, Shana and I really opened doors for a happy days. There's a lot of doors you guys open. Yeah, we we play Johnny Casino. That's the other thing that came. Johnny yeah. Casino and the Gamblers in the movie Grease. We have more songs on that album than any other artist. And uh, so Screamer Scott, my keyboard player, co-wrote Sandy that Travolta sang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, for us to be in the greatest rock documentary ever at Woodstock and then to be in the greatest musical ever, Greece. Uh, you know, was extremely fortunate. You know, we, and then of course we had the TV show. So we sort of made it not so much on records and airplay, but on event things and different mediums that that we were lucky part of, and you know, the biggest ever. So gave it a lot of good legs. The way you did Shanana, it was so incredible because it, it was a mixture of the music, musicianship and it was almost a mixture with theater. It was it was a real show. It wasn't just a yeah. rock concert. It was a, it was a show. And uh, the gold lame outfits that they were all wearing, you know, it just was so cool. I mean, it was really. Funny. When we first did, Bill Graham gave us good breaks, East and West Coast at, uh, at the uh, his theaters, the Fillmore East and West. And I went, we had had a sort of a sit down with the uh, the lighting crew. It, they were putting like psychedelic bubbles and things behind they behind us on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they were doing in the acts. And a lot of the guitarists would turn their back to the audience. And we were doing a different thing. We were doing like a Broadway musical sort of slant on it. We were, you know, I said, you know, we're choreographed and all that, but we want the lights on us. <laughs> And they finally figured that out, you know. We it was to, a mix. It, it was. It was the choreograph. It was almost it, a mix. It was. You had to mix a taste of that Motown, the way you were doing the whole moves. The band was doing it. Yeah. 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 We had one of the guys' older brothers was a. He he grew up on Long Island, you know, as a, as a greaser or a wannabe greaser, and he was a choreographer George George. And. Uh, you know, we all worked hard at it. You know, I wouldn't, well, it was fortunate in the long run, and especially the TV show, three or four of us had acting classes, had acting mm -hmm. chops, had, had been in theater since they were kids. I, I was in the Boston Children's Theater. So the the character for me was pretty easy. I had to play sort of street tough New York. And that's all right, because that wasn't far away from who I was. You know, so <laughs> everybody sort of, Everybody was sort of got a handle and a, a different slant on it. And, you know, it all worked out. It's pretty funny when you say that this tough guy, because when you talk about your education and what, what you put yourself through, because you think about the image you had. Okay, look at this scary, like I was telling you in the beginning. It's like, okay, this tough guy, yeah. this thug guy, you would never, the yep. real Jocko, you would never think yep. like, wow, all the, you know, it's pretty incredible. You're talking to me. Story. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, it's like you're two different guys. I'm talking to me. You're talking to me. You're talking to you. But it's yeah, like two different talking. guys. That's can, can have a conversation with with the words. Yeah. Ten questions. You're talking to me. You're looking at me. You got a problem. <laughs> it was it was pre. You know, Jocko. Now that you're saying this to me, it's about. Uh, it just hit me in the head. That character. Is who Joe Pesci is in the movie Goodfellas. That guy you talking Pesci. to me? You know what do I amuse you? It really yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, and 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 De Niro. And De Niro. That's right. It's a mixture of both, which is is very similar because it's funny because that movie is located the neighborhood where I grew up. So all those things were supposed to happen in Canarsie, Brooklyn. But it's very wow. much like you're talking to me. But I'm very impressed about where you went you had your education and you were going your school and you never stopped you had your dream but also yeah. you had okay this is it my education i'm going hey. and you did both let's talk about degrees uh and a pretty interesting thing we found out i found out later mm. about uh woodstock and how it was edited and there was uh, a famous editor and her new editor who did the Shanana stuff. Mm -hmm. 
was wow. an editor on the the Woodstock footage that just shown on that. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't even know that till you know forty years later. Yeah, well, you know. I think I just lost you for I. I think our internet just cut you out, Jocko. Hold on one second. I think it just cut you. It's the internet you, gods. You talking to me? I'm messing. I'm talking to you. I hope I'm talking. I think I'm talking to you. I don't yeah, see nobody else around. You talking to me? On your website, uh, is is there music that people can buy or what? What yeah, shirts, yeah. merchandise? Yeah. Yeah, and we have a very cool 50th anniversary package, you know, with the hat, the T-shirt. The, you can go vinyls or you can go disc, you know. Yeah, you got vinyls. If you know so anybody that has a CD player, they don't exist anymore. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. Chris Pace just goes, that was a great show. Debbie just wrote, this is another great interview. Thank you, Debbie. And, you know, most important, thank you, the audience, for being here. Uh, Steve, Grease for Peace. Jocko, let me ask you one more thing. You know, you, you definitely inspired a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff that happened because of Sha Na Na. And I know you're aware of it now. Like movies like Grease or Happy Days or just the whole American Graffiti, just the, the band, you know, you really, even tribute bands have come out now. If it wasn't for you, you're one of the first that really did it, you know, and did it on a scale from one to 10. You did it on 20, man. You blast off. How would you want your legacy to be remembered? How would people, you, you know? What? That that we we hard we rock hard. And... Some people, after this became popular again, this kind of try to fix it. You know what I mean? We none of these songs needed needed fixing, and we'd go out of our way to try to do it right. In terms of the, how the track was sounding, how the room they recorded in was sounding, how the how the doo parts in you know in step with each other that we we did our best because they were the best era of rock and roll rhythm and blues that you know we celebrated every night you did it rock and roll is here to stay jocko shanana thank you very much for rock being and here, roll is here to stay it will never, it will never die. die. It was meant to be <laughs> that way. That though way. I don't know why. why? I don't care what people say. People say rock, rock and roll, roll is here to here stay. To stay. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Bam. <laughs> I want to thank Jocko for spending some time with us and go check out our playlist, our top five countdown. It's where the artists pick the records that influenced them and that they love that meant something to their life. So you could see Jocko and everybody else on that playlist. All righty. Until then, everybody, we'll see you next week. And also next week we got coming up is actor, musician, writer, author from the X-Files from California. Cation. Well, he's putting a new record out. Actually, he's going to tell, talk a little bit about that, and he has a couple of secrets he's going to share with us. Actor David Duchovny will be in the house. That'll be next Saturday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Until then, everybody, it's only rock and roll, and we like it. I'll see you then. Bam!